Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. We thank you for strength. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word and your promise that has gone ahead of us. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And we know that we will enjoy the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we we'll pray. And so this evening I want to say a big thank you to my parents in the Lord, Reverend and Pastor D. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you very much, sir, for giving me the opportunity to do this. I also want to say thank you to all my pastors, Pastor Tayo, Life Center, and Tetsuski for, for always tolerating me and, you know, coping with my plenty wahala. I give her a lot of trouble, you know, but, you know, it's between me and her. You can't come in between us, you know. And so this evening, I'm, I'm saddled with speaking on effective communication. The truth about it is... Communication is everything we do from when we wake up to when we sleep. As a matter of fact, communication is 85% of what we do on every single day. If communication is 85% of what we do on every single day, it also means that communication is 85% of what we do all our lives. And that's very important reason why we must take communication extremely important. It has been shown, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we all know this, that communication right now is the number one criteria of employing anyone. It's not your certificate. It's not the schools that you graduated from. It's about the problems you can solve and how you can convince us that you can solve those problems. And so that's what we're going to be delving on. So we're going to, of course, talk about what we expect again after this class. After this class, I expect everyone here to be at least aware of their communication strength and then, of course, you would also do a needs assessment, more like a SWOT analysis, to know where your strengths are, your weaknesses, and how you can harness your strengths as opportunities and deal with the weaknesses because they are threats. And, of course, we will also have a needs assessment, like I said. So defining communication, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we all already know what it is. Speaking, of course, the act and process of using words, sounds, signs, or behaviors, to express or exchange information or to express your ideas, thoughts, feelings, etc., about someone else or yourself. And the truth about communication, like we all already know, is communication is two ways. So if I speak to you and I don't get a feedback, then communication is not complete. And as I'm speaking right now, this night, I'm getting feedback, even though you're not saying anything. But I can see expression on your faces, I can see how much I have your attention. I can tell somebody who's not listening to me by how they're looking away or looking down on their phone. And that's feedback on its own. So there's always the toe and fro. So before I delve into it, I'd like to define what we call principle and what we call a strategy. So a principle usually are ideas that are cast in stone on how something can happen. It's already cast in stone. And most of the time, principles are things you can replicate. So there's a principle of seed sowing as a principle of planting and harvesting, these things naturally happen. However, the strategy is what works out the principle. So the strategy is the action plan that you use to implement a principle. So why I'm saying this is we have a common principle of raising up a child the way that a child should go. And so most of our parents, that was the idea. They wanted to raise us up to be proper kids. But then they beat us a lot. Because that was the strategy that they had. A lot of us grew up taking strokes of Cain very, very much. And some of us turned out to be whole human beings. They tried their best. That was the strategy they had. Of course, the whole end was to make you a complete child. Right now, we don't beat our children as much as our parents beat us. But of course, the principle is the same thing. We also want to have whole children. But we don't beat them like the parent, like our parents beat us. We have devised new and better strategies to train up children, as it were, new and better. Every strategy has strengths and weaknesses. So even the strategies we use now have their own weaknesses. The best people are people who know how to balance these things well. So we have strategies that we're using now to achieve the same thing. Why am I saying this? The way you spoke to your daughter when she was three years old and four years old is not the way you're communicating with her now that she's a teenager but she's still the same person. The way I would speak to an audience of intellectuals is not the same way I'll speak to, forgive my word, illiterates, if I see people who are not educated. 
is different. Even if I'm trying to pass the same information to them, my principles can be the same, my goal can be the same, but my strategy has to be different. Why I'm saying this for a start is because we live in a world that is ever-changing. The world is changing very, very fast. Unfortunately, human beings are not learning that fast. So we're really not catching up with the change that we're experiencing in our world today. 90% of a job of a leader is communication. It's 5% of what you do every single day is communication. The problem we have in our present day world now is so humongous, it's so huge, that we need people who are going to assure people that their life will be better. So what I mean is this. We need leaders in this present day world. What is the biggest problem of Africa, if I would ask? Leadership, is it? That's the biggest problem of Africa, leadership. But where do we pick our leaders from? Do we pick them from Europe? No. We pick our leaders from amongst ourselves. So the biggest problem we actually have is self-leadership. We actually have people who can lead themselves, but we employ them to lead our states and employ them to lead our countries. We even employ them to lead organizations. These people who can't even lead themselves start businesses. Some of them even start families. And so, boom, calamity. Because you can't lead yourself. So the biggest problem we have, apparently, is self-leadership. While communicating to a group of people, it's extremely important for a leader to be emotionally smart. I'm sure everybody knows that. It's extremely important for a leader to be self-aware of who he is. It's extremely important for every leader to self-regulate himself. It's extremely important for every leader to have empathy. It's extremely important for every leader to have motivational skills. It's extremely important for every leader to have social skills. If you do not have these things, it's difficult for you to take up leadership. So one time in my organization, one lady who was the African director for communications, she sent a mail at 12 o'clock. She's the African director, so she's obviously up there. She sent a mail to someone at 12 o'clock, and she copied about 64 people. And by 2 o'clock, she got fired. And if you work in the NGO world, you know what we call the red line. If you cross the red line, you get fired. She got fired by 2 o'clock. She's been in the NGO world for a long time. And she sent, what she did was she sent a mail to the Federal Minister of Health inviting him to a program. And she copied us. And she got fired. She got fired not because she sent a mail. She was actually obeying an instruction. She got fired not because of the words of the mail. She got fired because of the tone of the message of the mail. So it simply means that while she was communicating her message, her mail said one thing, her tone said another thing. And it's amazing that people can actually get your tone from what you write. People can get your tone from what you say. People can get your tone from everything you do. As a matter of fact, communication is 7% verbal, is 93% facial and body language. Because when you're talking to us, our brains actually can process close to 300 to 1,000 words per minute. Our ears can only listen to about 125 words per minute. So if you're speaking to us, we're hearing you, we're seeing you, we're aligning everything together. Does it match? If it does not match, you're losing us. And so she got fired because the tone of her mail, the tone of her mail said that the Minister of Health had better attend a meeting because what the organization was doing in Nigeria was what the Ministry of Health was supposed to be doing anyway. So the best that you can do for yourself, do yourself a good and attend the meeting because we had done all the work and now we want to do a media dissemination. So the best you can do for yourself is attend the meeting. What I just said to you is the tone. Those were not her words. But that was the tone because what they did was they got people to analyze her message and then they sent the tone of the message to us. That was the first time in my life that I knew that you could send a mail and your words can be absolutely different from your tone. It's the same thing when you speak to a group of people that you employ or group of people that you lead. Every time you speak to us, what we are hearing might not be what you're saying. So if you're speaking to a group of people, 
Your words have to be laced with empathy. Your words have to be correct. Your words have to be simple. Your words have to be culturally laced. If not, you're going to lose people. And the last time I checked, there is no leader if there is no people. You can't, if, you, if you are leading yourself, you can lead yourself in your house. But once you want to go into public domain to lead people, if there's no people, there's no leader. And so it's important to make sure that, of course, as leaders, while we're speaking to people, we should know that there has to be a feedback mechanism. If we're not getting feedback from them, it's good to stop. Because what you're saying might not be what they're hearing. You might be speaking to people and what they're seeing from you is threats. You might drop a message on the WhatsApp group and you think you have dropped a simple message, but what you have done is you have stifled them of their peace. And do you know, the last time I checked, people have the right to vote out on you. Oh, yes. No matter who you are. Do you know why people resign from their jobs? It's not because the job itself is hard. It's because of the condition around the job. So people lose their jobs when their bosses speak so rudely and insult them and make them feel worthless or make them feel less of themselves. They can't handle it. The emotion is too much, the pressure, then they resign. They quit. It's not because the job itself is hard. It's because somebody has spoken so much to them, it makes them feel less of people. And then they quit. One out of every six adults is depressed. One out of every five adults is mentally imbalanced. Every 40 seconds, one person is committing suicide in the world. In 2020, the statistics is going to grow by 50%, by 100% rather. So every 20 seconds, one person is going to commit suicide. Why do you think people are committing suicide? It's because of mental pressure. Who gives them this mental pressure? Society. We. Leaders. People who speak into their lives. They say that the character of a child is most likely already formed by the age five. So most of us already have most of our characters formed by age five. At that age, however, you're not in control of the words that come into your life. It's people that are speaking to your life. Your parents, people around you, your guardian. And that's why we find some children that are timid. Because, of course, the words that have been spoken to them have brought out only timidity in them. They've probably been told that they can't do it. They've always been blamed. They've always been blamed for falling short. Or my be first in the school. And then you remind your child that there are other people to be first. She will be meji. She will be first. You know, why are you putting your child under the pressure of delivery to, to make you feel good about yourself? And so most of us grew up that way. But here, yeah, the problem we have now, Auntie Tutu, we have adults that are dysfunctional. We have adults that are unemployable. It's just 1% of the graduates that are churned out of Nigerian universities that are employable, that are employable, only 1%. So out of every 90,000 youth core members we have every year, what is 1% of 90,000? 900. 90,000, 10% is 9,000, 1%, 900. So only 900 coppers are employable in the whole of Nigeria every time they go to come. So it's not about first class or about 2-1 or about 2-2. Forget all that. Employers now don't even know what school you went through. They don't even want to see what grade you left school with. We want to see what you know how to do, what you have done, and what we have to be done. Those are the only three things we check. What does he know how to do? What has he done before? Track record. This is the problem we have in our organization. What can he do? And then we much make all those things. And if you don't catch up, we can't employ you. If you catch up, we employ you. So sometimes, some people go for interviews, they speak, they don't speak correctly, like they're not very good technically, but they're very confident and very sure of the nonsense that they're speaking. And we employ them. But the other guy comes with a first class and he expects us to be asking him engineering questions because he wants to work in an engineering firm. But then they're asking him questions that are cultural. They're asking him questions that will prick him, prick his mind. And then he's not getting the questions he wants to answer. And then he's stammering, he's stuttering. But they don't take him. Because every employer is an ambassador of your organization. You know there are some staffs you can't send on errands. Ah, there are some staffs you can't send to represent you. They will finish your organization. And most of the times, the people they send to represent organizations are not necessarily the 
technical guys. As a matter of fact, most of the time, they are not the technical guys. They are not the guys who do the analysis and plot the graphs. They are the guys who know how to negotiate and interact. Most board meetings we attend, if a board meeting was two hours, don't be shocked that the first one hour we're discussing football, Russian politics, Chinese politics, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, for one hour. And then 30 minutes, we'll talk about the main deal. And then the other 30 minutes, we'll talk about Arsenal, mind you. And that's a two hours board. Oh, you think it's a joke? That's a two hours board meeting. But guess what? You have been judged by everything. They want to be sure that you know how to stand political statements. They want to be sure that you are a little bit vast. That the only thing that you know in your life is makeup, 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 artist, makeup, artist. So when they now ask you a question about Nigerian politics, you don't even know anything about Nigerian politics. You don't even know the governor of your state or the deputy governor. You don't even know the job of the minister. You don't even know the name of the minister of agriculture. Oh, a lot of you don't know the name of the minister of agriculture. And you know, it, it's not a bad thing not to know these things. It's not a bad thing not to be vast. But it's a bad thing to stay on vast. Oh, it's not a bad thing. Can you remember more? But it's a terrible thing if you stay unknown. You know ignorance is loud? Ah, ignorance is loud. It is poor people that make a lot of noise. It's poor people that slam table and say, Do you know who I am? Who are you? Do you know who I am? Rich people don't do that. And wiseness is thick. The more you know, the less you talk. Because then your words are heavy. Words are still spirit and life. And people are still judged by their words. A man is only as better as his words. I cannot judge you by what you don't say. If, that's why if you keep quiet, I can assume that you're wise. Once you start talking, fully might start talking. And so when we talk to people, how you say it is extremely important. Your tone, you know, what you say is important. How you say it is everything. Like they say that diplomacy is when you tell somebody to go to hell and they will gladly take a bike and go. Of course, it's not about lying, it's not about being politically correct, but it's about being a good conflict resolutor. The truth is, every time you have to speak, and it's in a party where somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose, you have to be careful with the emotions of people you're playing with. Every word you say as a leader goes to people's hearts. You know people hear through their ears, they actually hear with their mind. The ear is just the passage where the words go through. It's like the eyes, we only see through our eyes actually see things with our minds and so your tone of talking is very important the next one is why you say it a lot of times when you speak to people as you're talking guess what they are putting together the past meeting we had the past conversation what you must have had the intention behind what you're saying intention you know we think about your words faster than we ah. <laughs> oh, wow. Pastor. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So intention. <laughs> so your intentions, we, we think about your words better than we're listening. We, we're thinking about what you're saying quicker than we're listening to what you're saying. So if, if, if I stand in front of the choir and I'm addressing the choir, they're looking at different things as I'm talking. They're hearing my words. They're looking at my eyes. They're looking at my expression. They're looking at my countenance. They're looking at my gesticulations. They're also thinking of what I said last. They're also thinking of the pattern that I have as a human being. They're adding all those things together because their mind needs close to 1,000 words to process what I'm saying, but their ears are only hearing about 100 words. So every time you stand in front of people to address them, put a lot of things into consideration. Pay attention to what they're saying. Pay attention to what they're not saying consistently. So one time, I told the story one time at Life Center about how I had a staff at work who got to work 11 o'clock for two weeks. 11 o'clock. I didn't say anything. I didn't, of course, nobody had the right to say anything if I didn't say anything. He got to work 11 o'clock every single day. And then, of course, the other guys in the office were looking at me that, am I not going to issue him a query? So, of course, I didn't issue him a query. At the end of the month, when we're going to have a status meeting, I made everybody realize that that guy was working in the middle of the night with me because we had some people who were working from another climb and their day was our night. 
and we had to be in meetings with them. But I didn't need that explanation for everybody in the office. The person that that guy is answerable to is me. So for every two weeks, he came late. But at a status meeting, I had to say it so everybody knows that it's not as though I'm condoning his lateness. But eventually, at the end of the month, what I'm checking is productivity. I'm not checking who came to work earliest and who left late. So for those of you that employ people and are very particular about measure something else. Measure productivity. What have they achieved for the month? And please, if, if you have an organization, we always say this over and over again. Define the job description before you employ people. So don't employ people. No. Write out the job that you want them to do. Then employ people and tell them to do the job. So don't employ people out of sentiments and then look for jobs for them. I'm sure everybody here knows that you're not supposed to employ your cousin because he's your cousin. Apart from the fact that destiny is not emotional, business, the business rules will not forgive you. They don't say because you're emotionally tied to somebody, business will not crumble. Your business will crumble in front of your eyes. And business doesn't understand you speaking in tongues. You can speak in tongues all you want. If you do not apply business principles, your businesses will crumble. And so another one is, you know, when you say it in an, in an for example, during an argument, like, I, like we said, 70% of mistakes at work are directly connected to, to poor communication. So today, I was very sad at work. What happened? There's an equipment in one of our labs that we bought for 12 million naira. And every time that equipment does a detailed analysis, they need a flash drive to take the data out. And then would of course, store the data in our database. However, the guys in the lab had been using different flash drives. So I think someone had put a flash drive that put a virus on the equipment, and it ruined the equipment. The equipment is going to cost us $4 million to fix. And of course, I, I, the first thing I did when I got to work was see a quotation of how much it would cost to fix that equipment. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know what to feel. I didn't know how to escalate it. I, someone just had... So I started asking myself, if we fire this guy, are we going to solve the problem? If we fix this machine, where are we going to get the money from? How are we going to recoup the money? How are we going to solve this? What are we going to do? Do I want to talk harshly to this staff? Do I want to ruin his day? Do I want to ruin his career? You know, all the options are still on my table. As I speak to you, I haven't decided what I'm going to do, to be honest with you. Because I, I realized I was so angry, it was professional of me to just take time off. So what I've done is given myself 48 hours to decide. So I'm going to think about it for 48 hours. What do you think I should do to that kind of a staff? <laughs> uh, th these things are real. Dude, he's married. He has two children. What do you think I should do to that kind of a staff? If I fire him, it's not going to bring the money back. It's not going to bring the equipment back. And he's a very intellectually sound person. He probably was just not an organized person. So here's what I'm going to do. First off, okay, so here's what I've done so far. I've called the company where they supplied the equipment. And they said the equipment is out of warranty. But I reminded the company of how much sales that they have made through me directly or indirectly, and how much of that equipment they have sold around Africa because of me, and how much sales have helped them get on all the projects that I'm on. I've made sure that they bought from these guys. So what I was leveraging on was the emotional bank that I had with them. So I first had to source my emotional bank with those guys, and eventually I got them to realize that it was good for them to replace that at no cost, even though my equipment was out of warranty. Because I had an emotional bank which I had deposited so much into, I wanted to withdraw. And of course, they had to let me withdraw. So of course, the guy contacted their company in South Africa. Those ones called the guys in Germany. We all had a talk. And I wasn't begging them. I was telling them. That's negotiation. I wasn't begging them to look like, we, no, no, no. I was telling them that how many have you sold in Africa? They had sold a hundred. This is the first one that has had that problem. That's a one percent. I'm sure there's a warranty, there's a warranty fund that every company has that would cover things like this. So ask for it because I've done so much for you guys. I have not escalated this matter to my boss. 
So when I secure that agreement and it's safe and it's done and dusted, I will then go back to the lab and insist on an SOP, standard of operation, to ensure that nobody uses that equipment except authorized people. And the next thing I'm going to do is have a dedicated flash drive to that system and then create more rules around the usage. And then I'll take the guy last. The guy is the last thing I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the guy to my personal office and say, if I had sent a mail, you would lose your job. If I had done this, I would ruin your day. But because here's what we've done, here's what we've done, here's what we've done. So what do you think that we should do to you? <laughs> Punish yourself. And so there are high chances that he's going to be logical. He's going to regret it so bad. I haven't said anything to hurt his feelings, but yet I've put the cane in his own hand. That's more like dealing with somebody emotionally. Then I've not ruined him. And he's still going to go to the lab. He's still going to work tomorrow. But he's going to be more careful. Now he's going to own the process. So what I've done is I've given him the process. You're responsible. I've solved your mess. But this can't happen again. I'm going to try to run as quick as I can. And of course, what you don't say is also very important when you're talking. Silence isn't always golden. Especially for people who are married or in relationships. And you expect your spouse to know what you are saying without you saying it. Like... Are you not supposed to know? How is someone supposed to know how you feel? How is someone supposed to know? Because you have lived together with someone. Okay, you've lived together, of course. They, they know some things. But if you don't speak, how will people hear? How will people know, really? You just, you know, ladies are very defensive of that. You should know. You've been with me for a while. You should know. But the man can't know everything, can he? So in organizations too, if you don't speak, People will not know what you mean, especially as the boss. Speak, be clear. Don't let people say that, oh, you're quoting more mincing. We've been working together for a while. No, make it clear. Very, very clear. Of course, your body language, your facial gesticulation is everything. You know, more than half of the words that you do not say, that you, more than half of the words do not matter if your expression isn't aligning with your words. And so there are things that we expect anyone not to do about communication. First of it is don't preempt or judge people while you're talking to them. You know, it, it's important for us to expect the best of people every time we speak to them. Every time. Every time we speak to people, please expect the best of them. Preempting people is like already you have made them... You, you, know, you know, whether we like it or yes... Everyone gravitates away from stressful relationships. Everyone gravitates towards things that give them rest of mind, that give them peace of mind. So if you're a leader that makes people emotionally stressed, you're going to lose them. And there are different ways to make people emotionally stressed. Already speaking about how they are going to react even before they react. You're already putting them in a straight box and a jacket. You're already seeing them like people who don't know much, don't know anything, and you are speaking from the point of perfection. I'm the perfect guy. So come, sit down. Let me tell you five steps to take to come a little close to me. You know, every time, every time you speak that to people, they will listen to you the first time. They will listen to you the second time. Your crowd will reduce over time. They will vote out on you. Leadership is more emotional than intellectual. Extreme emotional strength is what you need. Extreme emotional strength. Project managers are really not the smartest people, but they're the smartest guys are working with everybody. And it's not about being diplomatic or political. No, it's just been about emotionally correct. So, of course, don't take, don't, don't, don't take off attention from the person you're talking to. You know, if I, if I was speaking to Minister Tokwe right now, and I'm talking to him, but I'm looking somewhere else, it simply means that I'm not paying attention to him. It simply means that he's not important to me. That's a facial expression. I'm talking, my, my, my words are 7%. My facial expression is 93%. Which one is going to carry more power with him? It's my facial expression. I'm not with him 93% of the time that I'm communicating with him. So if I, it simply also means that I don't regard him that much. It simply means that he's not important in that conversation we're having. Once you give people all those feelers, you would lose them. Eventually, the summary of it is... As a leader, you'd have to keep people engaged with you. Once you don't have people anymore, there's nothing as leaders, there's nothing you're leading. 
And so you're talking to people, there has to be empathy. You'd have to understand from them. What are they feeling? So it's like at the beginning of the year, you want to draw out the plan for your organization for this year. And you sit down in your room and you draw all the plan and you go back to the office and you stick the plan on the wall and you say, this is the plan. Everybody must walk by it. It's dangerous. So there's something we call stakeholders meeting. In every organization, there are stakeholders. Who, in every department, there are stakeholders from the leader to the members. And guess what happens? In every stakeholder meeting, everybody has a number. What I mean by a number is everyone is equal at a stakeholders meeting. And so we want to hear what you want to say. I'm sure you know very much that the gatesman in a bank is as important as the guy sitting inside the bank, as the general manager. And so if every time they don't invite that guy to stakeholders meeting, they are risking the whole security of the bank. Nothing where Musa know they hear for gates. I agree. But trust me, Musa has information that you need. So every time in the bank when they have stakeholders meeting, they call the security guys too. What do you know? As a matter of fact, these guys might even have customers that can help the bank. What if they turn down a dango? What if they turn back a dangote who has come in jeans and sneakers? Because these days, billionaires walk in t-shirts. Billionaires don't cack too much anymore these days. The richer you are, the simpler your dress would even become, apparently. And so obviously, during communication too, you know, don't use technical languages. If, if, you're, if you're addressing people, a lot of us know this man called um, Patrick Obahe Agbon. That Nigerian, that Nigerian politician who speaks a lot of English. He's not communicating with anyone, you know, right? You know he's only talking to himself. And after a while, what happened to him? The comedy industry started to invite him to shows because he became more of a comic than a communicator. He wasn't communicating. And so if you want to speak with people, as simple as you can, as quick as you can, as emotionally correct as you can, as empathetic, empathetic as you can, as motivational as you can, the work of a leader is plenty. It is plenty. But the truth is, as a church, what we're doing is we're raising people who are leaders because the society or need leadership. There's no leadership in the society we are in. There's no leadership anywhere. Have you seen the Nigerian budget? Does it look like something that was cast by leaders? No, it looks like things that was cast by people who just want to grab. So we actually don't have leaders. Oh, it's the biggest problem. We, the, the guys I work with, so I work with a number of people from all around the world, primarily guys in the U.S. And one, what I realized that the white guys do is once they find a guy that they trust in Africa, they will, they will always work with that guy. They will rather use that guy that they trust over the big man they don't trust. So there was one project that they were going to bring me on. So the former Minister of Health was going to speak about a particular topic which was going to talk about leadership in Africa and I was going to speak on another topic. But they realized that the topic of leadership was better spoken by me than the Minister of Health. So they rather contacted the Minister of Health and said, sir, we're, we're changing your topic. And he later found out that the topic was given to me. And of course, he was sitting down at Sheraton and I was talking about leadership. Because the white guys realized that these guys are just popular people who found themselves in positions. You know, we vote for people because they're popular. So next election, they're going to say, ah, that guy is popular in the north. El Rufa is popular in the north. Tinubu is popular in the southwest. The question is, do they have leadership CVs? You know, the, the people we don't check their CVs are political office holders. We don't check their CVs. We check CV of every other person. But we don't check the CV. We check their popularity and their political stamina. We check the wrongest things. What do they check in the U.S. and in the Britain? They check CVs. They track you to primary school level. They track you to any affair that you must have had. They track you to everything. Because they realize that if a man cannot fix himself and fix his family, he can't fix a country. So what we're doing right now is trying to ensure that people here can fix themselves well. You are so properly fixed, you are so properly organized that if we tell you, if Rev calls you, you know Rev cannot take up positions outside easily. But if Rev has everybody at his beck and call, 
and he says, he will go and take this. He will go and take this. He will go and take this. That's because we have been properly groomed. And he has seen it. That we ourselves are self-leaders. We can lead ourselves. Have you gone to people's houses where you don't know where the kitchen and the dustbin is different? You don't know the difference between dustbin and kitchen? Because everywhere is scattered. Because you enter their sitting room, there's soup all over the floor. There's nylon and there's amala somewhere stained. And the front of the screen, there's one amala line. There's one... And then the guy gives you all the excuses there is as to why it's like that. No, 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 can't rebel. No, can rebel. No, can rebel. No, can rebel. Nothing just always seems like that. It's a very, very strong sign. There's a German saying that you can tell a lot about a man from his car. If you don't take care of yourself, I can't put things in your hand. You know, some of us are entrepreneurs. We want investors. We want people to come and invest in our businesses. And there is money. I would say every time, money is the least problem that you need as an entrepreneur. Money is the least of your problems. Guess what the investor wants to see? He wants to see a system that works. Once an investor sees a system that works and has track record, it means that you have invested into it. And it's easy for him to invest. So the question is, what are you good at? What have you invested in by yourself before you come and sell to me to invest? There's money in fact, there is so much money that people have in the bank. They just haven't seen systems that work. We're not setting up systems that work. We have proposals that are not sellable. We have proposals that show what we wish to do. So that's more like a wish list. We have proposals that have, if I have 10 million, this is what I plan to do. This is what I plan to do. This is what I plan to do. That's not what the investor wants to see. Pastor Ron, is that what you want to see? No. You want to see what the guy has done with 100,000 naira. You want to see what the guy has done with 50,000 naira. And then you want to see what principles he applied. You want to see how he meticulously managed 50,000 naira. And you want to see what he did and turned 50,000 naira to in a few months. And then you give him your 500,000 naira. And then you want to see what he's going to do within a three years, in a few months, before they will open you to bigger riches and 5 million and 10 million. Why do you have your first proposal being a 10 million naira proposal when you yourself have never invested 5,000 naira? So another one is, um, you know, don't give unwanted advice and solution. I, I heard this from one of my white bosses in the U.S., and he was saying that if someone doesn't seek your advice, don't give it. You know, if someone doesn't ask for solutions from you, don't give it, no matter how much of it you have. So if you see somebody who is having problems in their businesses, if they don't come to you for advice, it sounds like a tough thing to do because you're seeing your mentor, your protege fall, and then... If it doesn't come to you for advice, don't give it. And advice is a legal tender. As a matter of fact, it's a legal document. They can use it against you because they can record it. And if something goes bad, they will say it was you who said so. They can use it absolutely against you. And then, of course, you know, reassure people while you speak with them. Everything eventually boils down to the persons, the persons. You know, the five attributes of emotional intelligence is... First, self-awareness. Second one is self-regulation. Those two are for you. The remaining three are for the people you're interacting with. Motivation. The next one is social skills. And then the last one is um, empathy. Empathy is about people. Empathy is when you're leading people and you're not feeling their pause. If you keep people in a meeting for too long, you know you're going to lose them. Oh, you know, you know the longest listening span of an adult right now is 20 minutes? It's 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, if you're not making sense, people will bow their head and be on their phones. They'll turn off on you. And so whatever you want to say, say it quick. As quick as you can. Convince people as quick as you can. And so the most important thing for us is be aware of where we are. Be aware of our strengths. You're somebody who gets angry quick. It's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So there's nothing to be proud about. To say, Imimangbuno is not anything to be proud about. There's nothing as saying that I am, I am a calm, gentle person. I don't talk quick. Those things are not things you should put out as things to be proud about. No, 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 no. You should control your emotions. Children are controlled by emotions. Adults control their emotions. So if your emotions are still controlling you, then we can't employ you to manage money now. Because your emotions will make you sow the money. Or you go and give the money to your auntie for, for a birthday party or something. And so control your emotions. 
So I would say a few things to overcome the barriers of effective communication. One of it will be connecting with your audience. Another one will be is the slide okay? Another one will be summarize what you have to say. Another one would be keep it simple words, cultural sensitivity. As, as much as we think that Americans are not respectful people, they are actually very respectful people. In the corporate world, Americans are very respective. They know the difference. An American writes a mail, he says, dear sir. It is when he's writing a mail to his friend that he says, hi. Dear sir is not for your boss. Dear sir is not even, dear sir is not an, I'm sorry, hi is not an official language. They're this one, they're that, they're that. So there's cultural sensitivity too. One time we were having a meeting, it was a conference call, and we had people from US, Ghana, South Africa, and then we had some French people, France, Senegal. And I was coordinating the meeting, and I'll say agenda number one, and then we'll start to talk about it. The guy from US would chime in, the guy from Ghana would shout in, and you know we Nigerians, our voice, our voice naturally loud. You know our voice is loud. If you go for international meetings, you can tell all the Nigerians in a short while. Our voices are loud, probably because we grew up in environments with a lot of noise, generator and everything. So we're always talking on top of the noise. So when the noise goes down, we're still talking on top. So by the time we go outside to meetings, you can tell Nigerians. Nigerians are discussing, but it looks like they are arguing. But they're actually, actually just talking. Do you know the place that we have to go to, to go to the place? And then the white man comes in front of you and he goes, do you know the place that we have to go to go to the place? You can't hear the white man, but the white man also thinks you're shouting at him. And so there are different people. So that day we had a meeting and we had different people from different areas calling in. And the Americans would chime in, the Ghanaians would chime in, the South Africans would chime in. Of course, I was Nigerian, I was talking to. And then we went agenda one, agenda two, number three, Item number four. And then at the end, I was saying, A or B, anybody has any other thing that we want to talk about? Thank you, sir. Wow. Uh, okay. And so at the A or B, I said, anybody has any other thing that we want to talk about? And while we're about to close up the meeting, somebody said, excuse me, excuse me. And I said, yeah, who's that, who's that? And then he says, Jackie is from France. And she says, can I say something? Apparently, that person from France and Senegal had not spoken throughout the meeting. And we didn't know because we got the job done. We're getting the job. We're getting all the items solved. And he said, can I say something? And I said, yes, yes, sure, you can say something. And then she says, item number one. And then she takes all of us back to item number one. She had something to say in item number one. But we didn't give her a chance to speak because we're all... Entering, 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 entering. That was when I realized that French people speak only when you tell them to speak. They're very culturally sense. They won't interrupt you. Nigerians will interrupt you. <laughs> you, know, you know when you're talking. Eh, hey, even that thing that you said. This is eh, hey, that one that you said. So we have a lot of half statements, half statements, half statements. But we're understanding ourselves. Oh, or one year, our, I know where you're going to. You know where I'm going to. But then we meet. But then we meet a French guy who doesn't speak unless you are done speaking. So we were done with the meeting. She took us back to item number one. We realized we had to spend another 45 minutes to address the concern of the French-speaking people. Same thing as the Japanese guys. But it's different from the Americans. And so after I had that situation, of course, I went online and found a short course on how to interact with people from different demography and different culture. And then, of course, strengthening ground rules. You'd have to raise your hand before you speak. If you don't do this, you can't do this. We're global leaders, and we're not only going to be leading Nigerians. My point is there are a lot of things we need to learn quickly and learn now. Because once we get out there, the global world doesn't forgive anybody. If you mess things up and cross the red line, you'd lose your job. They'll fire you. Your reputation will go. And you know the Americans, once they know that you've been fired once or twice, no matter what you say, they will not employ you. Once you know that you have bad track record, they wouldn't take you anymore. It's tough. But then in summary, to measure our effectiveness as communicators, first is we want to obviously define our goal. So this is going to be contextual. So, what I'm, so I'm going to use a simple example. If I have a group of people that I'm leading, and what I want to do is communicate the company's goals to all of them. 
and make them run by it. The first thing I want to do is define the goal of that communication that I want to do. And then I want to understand the people that I'm speaking with. Are they very busy people? Are they people that have been working nine to five and now they are at a meeting with me? Are they people that have been working all week long? Are they people that are married? Are they people that are single? Are they jobless? Are they frustrated? You obviously want to understand the people you're speaking with and then you want to define your benchmarks. So what I mean by defining benchmarks is at the end of this conversation, this is what I want to pass across. So I want to make sure that at the end of this conversation or at the end of this communication with these people, I'm able to achieve at least this. I'm able to get their buy-in into the idea. I'm able to get them invest into what I'm saying. I'm able to hear them feedback. I'm able to rationalize the feedback and deliberate on it. And then, of course, I want to define my metrics, meaning that I want to see like how many people responded. I want to see how many people I lost while I was communicating. I want to see... I want to measure how effective I actually communicated with those people. You can measure that anytime you have a chance to speak with people for a while. One hour, two hours. You want to see how effective it is. And then, of course, you want to select your data collection tool. Sorry, that's just um, a little bit technical, but then you understand. Because I want to see how many people responded. I want to see what they say, the quality of their answers. I want to see the quality of feedback I receive. And then I want to use that data to make better decisions so that next time I want to speak with those set of people, I want to improve. I want them to speak better to me. I want them to understand me better. The summary of it, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world where people have problems every day. And everybody will naturally gravitate towards relationships that don't give them stress. If you lead a people and you increase their stress level, you make them more mentally imbalanced, you, make, you leave them depressed every single time, it's just a matter of time. You're going to lose people just by what you're saying, what you're not saying, you're not listening, or what you're not listening to. I pray that God will strengthen us in Jesus' name. Oh, this is the end of my presentation. So I, I, should, I should have mentioned at the beginning that if you, if you have any questions to ask, anything, emotional, stress level, how to communicate better, how to listen better, and anything, you can write them down. We'll take the questions. And we have a few people that will be on our panel, panel session to take any question that you have to answer. So permit me to please invite to the stage here, Barista Somia Biodo, Mrs. Mosun Omotunde. Is Mr. Fola Ogunlano here, please? Okay, they're bringing a chair. Is Mr. Fola Ogunlano here? Oh, great. Thank you very much, sir. So we're going to be taking a few questions. Your questions can bother around anything. Can bother around things that, help, that will help you communicate well. Can bother around things that will help you listen well. It can bother around things that will make you judge decisions well. It can bother around things that will make you make better and stronger decisions, even things that are emotional. Yes, please, sir, if that's fine. Please put your hands together for them, if that's fine. Um, can, can we have some microphones, if, if that's fine? Hi, Paula. And so, and so we've, we've, the, the four of us have had what we call a green room, where we had been talking for a few days on matters around this. And we have had some, some questions that have come up, some proposed questions that we think people might ask. And of course, some situations. First off, I want to start with you, ma'am, Mrs. Mosun. You, you know, you mentioned something on the group while we're talking. So she shared an experience of something she wrote online about a young girl who had um, experienced some form of abuse and it has made her who she is. So right now, some people are cranky adults. They are very, very cranky adults. But we wonder why they are cranky. It's probably because of the abuse that they've had from when they were young. Tell us about the, the, the young lady, please, if you don't mind. Good evening, Carlos. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. I do not take it lightly. Um, Emeka, I didn't expect you to talk about that on the stage. That well, was confidential. Oh, I'm what sorry. What if she's here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so people that have experienced abuse when they were young <laughs> and they have now become cranky adults, you know, and it's largely because of some form of abuse that they've been exposed to. Maybe they've not been physically abused. Maybe it's just things that they've seen or it's things that have been spoken into their lives, you know. You know, you've, you've probably met one or two people like that in your experience. <laughs> Tell us about it. He's indeed a communication expert. <laughs> okay, yeah, there, there are so many people that are going through so many things because they haven't had the opportunity to express themselves. Um, when things happen to you, bad things to be precise, it's, often, it's not often, it's necessary that you find a way of venting, you know. Um, for the white people, they have psychiatrists, they have psychologists, they have counselors. Here, we seem not to take those things seriously. We, However, we, pray, we pray in tongues. <laughs> However, we, we need those things because when you're able to express, simply talking about it sometimes solves half of it. It's not necessarily because you want, you need it to be resolved, but you just want to let it off your chest. Now, this young lady has, you know, she's kept it in for a long time. She's in a relationship now and it's affecting herself and her um, partner. Yeah, exactly. As it her were. her As it were. partner, yeah. So she uh, called me because she knows that, uh, well, probably because she knows I wouldn't judge her. Most people would. And she spent almost two hours talking. When she was done, I was almost crying because she's in pain. But when you see her, she's a picture of decorum. She's this gentle. But the things she's holding inside, they're really venomous things. So she's pouring it out on her partner. And, you know, I told her, babe, anytime, just call me. I would find time. We would talk. You know what? Vent. Hit me. And the ones I can advise you about, I will. The ones I can, then I would probably talk to my husband, who is a fountain of knowledge, and, you know, help you out. <laughs> Oh, okay, so you just had to bring that in to his a fountain Apologies. of knowledge. <laughs> and so it, I, I think the most important thing is to be aware of who you are. And so, you know, um, you cannot lie to me and lie to yourself. It's extremely important that you know who you are. So know that you had a blocked out childhood, meaning that know that you had an abusive childhood. Lay it on the table. There's nothing wrong in doing research to find out what kind of your person is and what solution it is to solving your kind of person. Because I can imagine now that the guy that she's with or whoever she's going to be married to, as it were, probably doesn't even know this history. And you cannot know these things. And then, no matter how much questions you ask, you really can't, can't know these things. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Based on what you said the other time, I'm in Nigeria. And the, um, so... My advice to everyone is that, you know, you find someone you can talk to. Find someone who's objective, who's trustworthy, who wouldn't judge you. But you need to talk. How would you, how would you advise a leader, somebody leading that kind of a girl? So somebody's leading her like in a group. She's intelligent. She has all the sense of decorum, like you said. So she's all put together. She comes. But you want to lead that kind of person. The person obviously sometimes is cranky and repulsive and all that. What would you advise a leader over that kind of a person? Uh, well, that's, you know, it's here and there. But emotional intelligence is everything. So emotional intelligence would help you to, you might not totally understand the situation, but you are able to profile her a bit. So you understand her, you understand yourself. You know, as a leader, when you're talking to a um, team member, most of the time you know when they're rebuffing you, you know. But if you're not emotionally intelligent, you're going to lose it and you're just going to, you know, keep talking at her. Yeah, yeah Barista Somia Building, you, you were mentioning, I, I know that you mentioned about some people having very loud voices and being misinterpreted. So some people have naturally loud voices. So some, some people have post-war traumatic syndrome, which makes them speak above the bomb, and they naturally have loud voices. How would, you, how would you speak with somebody like that who thinks that they're always misinterpreted for shouting or being rude? Thank you very much for the opportunity. 
I think the most important thing for the person speaking is to realize that they don't need to be allowed to be heard. Um, I believe that for the person listening, us, the person being spoken to, it's also important to help the person understand for each instance that I could hear you even if you are not as loud. Um, consistent correction will help the person realize and then help the person start monitoring it. It's also important for people to feel allowed. If they don't feel judged, then they are freer to express themselves the way they can. And then if they are able to express themselves accurately, they will not have problems with their tone, they will not have problems with the people that are listening to them. But firstly, it has to be from a point of self-confidence. So if people are speaking very loud, it's most likely because they want to be heard. Not that they don't know that their voice is loud, but they just want to lord what they're saying over you. And sometimes that can be born out of the fact that while they were growing up, they were not heard. Most, and, mostly. And that, that can also tell on their confidence. What do you have to say about listening? I realize that it's an extremely important part of communication too. What's your take on being an active and a good listener? All right, thank you very much for the opportunity as well. Um, I think it's been proven empirically that 45% of the time, we're always listening. Yeah, true. Okay, so we, and permit me to quote a scripture, it's why the Bible tells us that we should be swift, we should be slow to, sp slow to speak, but swift to listen, you know. So it is important that we listen. Can I just share with us different kinds or different forms of listening? Okay, because it's been, it's been observed that there is the passive kind of listening. This is where the individual is not particularly paying attention to what is being said. And then there is also the misunderstood kind of listening. You're listening, but you're misinterpreting what the person is actually, the information the person is actually conveying. And most times it's born out of the fact that you have a mindset built around what the person is saying already. So your mind is made up. Yeah. And then the person is talking and you're like, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, to ask whether it's men or women that do it more, I think I'll leave that open. I hear someone saying yes. <laughs> so, but that's the misunderstood aspect of listening. But we also have positive sides of listening. For instance, facilitative listening. Yeah. That's where you encourage the person to talk. You punctuate whatever the person is saying. So yes, you are listening, but you have to do a bit of speaking. So, for instance, the person says something, and you're like, so did he really go there? At what point in time are you, are you serious? That is the person's sense of you are part of what part of, is Yeah, part of that conversation. It's not so, active listening. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so facilitative listening. So, I think there are positive sides of listening techniques that we can imbibe as individuals. But the question is, is it every time you should be involved in facilitative kind of listening? I think it's no. For instance, you are involved in a conversation you probably shouldn't be a part of. Why are you then asking, are you for real? It's none of your business. You should not be there in the very first place. Okay. So you need to know what you need to be a part of, and then you need to know how you can engage that particular person. Listen more, not from the point of view where you made up your mind, but as objectively as you can. That's about it. Thank you very much. Good chance together. That's the murder. Um, um, so maybe I want to ask you, somebody asked this question that, how do you correct somebody that always gets angry when you try to correct them? And what communication skill is best to pass this message across to the person? So, of course, paraphrasing, it means that you correct somebody, but the person gets angry when you correct them. You know, how do you want to, how do you want to obviously get the person to do what you're saying? You, you know, I, 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 you know, this, this, this picture isn't a complete picture. Why this picture isn't a complete picture is we, we're not getting the feedback from this person of what you're correcting this person for and how you're correcting this person, what tone you're using, what language you're using. So if I wanted to correct somebody in my team who was older than me and I knew that this person was statusly, age-wise, and everything older than me, and I want to correct that person, I'll probably do it in a, in a different way than I'll correct somebody who's younger than me. It's just cultural balance. You probably want to be um, satirical, you probably want to be jovial about it. Why do you still make your point? No, what's your position about that? So can you come again just to that? So, so this person says that he corrects somebody, but the person gets angry when they correct him or her. 
how best do I then correct this person who gets angry when I correct him or her? Okay. I think the motive behind the correction and how the person goes about it matters. I think from one of your slides, you mentioned something like what we say is important, yeah. but how we say it is it's it's everything. Important. Yes, yeah. it's, it's a lot more important. So the motive behind it, if the person gets the wrong vibe, for instance, the person feels, why must, because the person can ask, why must it be you correcting me every single why time? Why must it be me that and you correct it every time? Every single time. And then the challenge might also be, you never really pay compliments. So it seems like you are always in the wrong. critical, you're always seeing the wrong, you never see the positives. Like um, Arthur Samir rightly mentioned, for instance, you have the gentleman who is always speaking with a loud voice, and then you correct the person. The question is, every single time you now start off the conversation with a low tone voice, have you appreciated that? The chances are that if you pay frequent compliments to the right thing the person does, it's, easy to correct it's, them, it's a lot easier for you to correct the person when the person does the right thing. So I think that's. I think the question came from that, <laughs> from that area. So some, someone says that um, how best do you communicate with a boss, especially when your boss needs to correct an error that she has made? You see, you see. So it best, let me just say that again. What is the best way to of communicating to your boss, especially when you need to correct an error that that boss? Has made, you know, you know, you know. We Nigerians are amazing people. We're very, very amazing. I, I honestly don't know how to answer this question. Really, C can you help? So you have a boss who has committed an error that you recognize, but you want to correct the boss. What style of communication is best? It's it's best. Jackie Chan style. <laughs> okay, um, th this this is an amazing question. No, but that, that, that's who we are, Nigerians. You know, yes. we're very critical people. Yeah, you, you know two Nigerians can tell us the problem of the whole country in 10 minutes. But those two people will never tell us the solution of one aspect of it. You know, we, we always know what people do wrong. We, like, like I said, we probably should pay more, com more attention to complimenting what people do right. It, it will be easy for you to withdraw from the emotional bank if you have to correct them later. And I've corrected my boss before. So what I did was suggest it to him. You don't, you don't correct your bosses. You opine to them. You suggest things to them. And of course, you study your boss to know the best time to throw in those things. So there are some financial meetings I want to have with my boss. I have it with him after he has come from a very nice trip and he's happy. And I planned all the logistics and he's happy and we meet. Or we're at an, at an airport. He's so excited. He's in his happy mode. I want to discuss some financial decisions with him. Because at that point, he would most likely not be too critical. And then I want to say, okay, let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Okay, you remember that you said that it's better to do this. Okay, you remember? So it's like you're still saying your opinion, but you're giving him the credit. Your boss always just wants credit. That's the truth. Bosses like credit. So find a way to give them credit and do the work. It's a simple... But if you want to show the world and us... That you want to correct your boss. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's that's actually our African is in the African context. It's not general. I have a Canadian boss who I had that problem with. You know, I, I edit and proofread a lot of his work. I also write for him. However, because of the Nigerian, you know, my tendencies, if he makes uh, mistakes and initially if he made mistakes and sent to me, you know, I wouldn't tell him this is what you've done. I would yeah. try to be. So uh, there was a day he actually called me out on it and he said, I, I, I trust you, but you're not very, very truthful. You know, and I was shocked because I mean, I tried to be honest, but he said, you're not very truthful. He said, when I place your work beside my work, I see a difference. And why aren't you telling me the truth? I realized that it was different from the Nigerian, you know, cons he wants you to tell him this and this is wrong. But here, you know, we have big egos and you have to... You know. and, 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 you know, that, that's, that's the cultural thing where the way you relate with some other people is different. But, of course, it's important to know the context in which you are operating. Yes, I understand that the guys abroad will 
the professors would say, call me Tim. Like one of my boss introduced himself as professor. <laughs> and you know, your name is not professor this. Your name is not doctor this. Your name is not pastor this. Your name is James. But you know we're very title-driven people. So we're also very particular with how you do. So it's just all contextual. The way you want to deal with your Nigerian boss is different from the way you want to deal with your American boss. But nevertheless, be, you know, be truthful. But even if you wanted to correct that, you will still suggest it to her. You'd probably say, um, why did you do this? I think, I, what do you think about, okay, so what do you think, what do you think about us using this is different from, let us use this, or um, this is wrong. Sometimes just how you phrase those things. Sir, this is a very nicely written, is that sandwich thing? This is a very nicely written statement. Sir, what do you think about what you wrote in column this? I, I was thinking that, what do you think about this? It's just diplomacy. Like the Yorubas, you know, it's just how you say it. It's as important, it's more important than what you're saying, uh, apparently. So this person says, if you have hurt a person's feelings with your word and action, how best can you fix it? Especially if the person is not accepting your apology, or the person is avoiding you, Mr. Somi. Thank you. The same way you hurt the person is the same way you fix it. You have the responsibility, and if you take responsibility, it becomes easier. People don't always want to be apologized to. I don't want to be apologized to. If you have hurt someone, you need to find a way to make the person hear it, even if the person is not willing to listen to it. So for instance, if you have done something wrong to someone and you're trying to get the person's attention to apologize, and the person is not giving you that audience, then you look for a way to apologize that the person will not have a choice than to listen to it. Say for instance, you keep trying to call the person's attention, then you send a message. The person will read it, whether or not you are there. If the person is not responding, then you send an email. Detail your explanation. What the person will not give you five minutes to say in front of them. In fact, they may not give you two minutes in front of them to say it. Behind you, they'll spend one hour reading that email and they'll get all the message they are trying to say. So just make sure you find a way that they will not have a choice than to get what exactly you're saying and please be as clear as possible. Let there be no ambiguity even when you're trying to correct a wrong. That's, I think, I think that's, nicely, that's nicely said. Very good. So this person says that as a graduate, how can a graduate develop himself to the level where he can be very good, where he can get a very good or better job? How can a graduate develop himself to the level where he can get a very good or better job? So let, let me quickly answer this, that, that it, takes, it, takes, it takes me only 45 seconds to look at a CV now. Because there are so many CVs that sometimes I get to look at every day. So just let your CVs actually say what you can do. Don't tell us what state you came from or what local government you came from. Nobody's even interested in knowing your age or your sex anymore. People want to see, like I said, the problem, can you do it? So here's how to position yourself to get a better job. Find what you're good at. Spend time learning that thing. So you know sometimes these days they say, um, they're looking for a 23-year-old person with three years experience or four years experience. And you ask yourself, experience, school. But nobody ever told you that, who says that your first work has to be after school? You will work while you're in school. So you can intern. That's the simplest way to go with. Intern with people, see how the problems in their organization comes up and see how they solve it. And then put those in your CV. You don't even have to put internship. You can say that you worked with this person and these were the problems you were saddled with and this was how you solved them. Because eventually when I look at your CV, I want to see what you have solved, what we have to solve and how you will solve them. And you are positioned to get a better job. I don't know how else because it's about solving problems. Money only gravitates towards people who solve problems. So if, if you can't solve any problem, then you shouldn't take up any job. Take up internship. Take up volunteering, but never be without work. Always have something that you're doing. Learn something. Learn to solve problems with people before you're solving problems for yourself or for other people by yourself. So one last question, and then we'll round this up. Um, we all know that Africa is patriarchal. Patriarchal, you mean, of course, tilted towards the man. Well, women are usually looked down on in business. I am four, four feet tall. 
It's four feet tall, tall. That's very short. Okay. I'm four feet tall and I'm 22 years old. I don't want to lose my voice because a bunch of men can't take the truth. Can't take the truth because I work with a lot of men. What do I do? Oh, so of course, she's not, she's, you know, she's four feet and she feels that people are, people are watching her. I don't know, really. Like, people are judging her by how tall she is, you know, but how would you advise a lady like that? Because she's working with men, so she probably feels intimidated and bossed. How would you boost her confidence, Sister Motu? Okay. Um, I don't have all the answers, but, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, I suspect this young lady is being talked down at because she's small, you know. Um, a lot of people have that problem, addressing people shorter than themselves. You begin to talk to them like they're children. Um, however, I would advise her to work on herself, develop her content and her confidence. Now, when her content is right, let me put it this way. If your content is, if you're shaky and you're not sure of what you want to say, a tall person or a senior person could stagger you. But if you know what you're about and your content is on point, no matter what they say, when they're done, you know, it's your time to shine. And then you give the best that you can. If you keep doing that again and again, after a while, they know they'll start calling you small but mighty. I it's believe you. Natural. So it's largely about the lady. It's not as much as it is about the man. It's really yeah, about her. Exactly. So she needs to work on her content. Yeah, exactly. I hope you heard that. Mr. Somi, what are your rounding off points? Thank you. I was just going to branch a little bit into workplace communication. And I was just going to say that um, we need to learn to be official when it's time to be official and be colloquial when it's time to be colloquial. There are many things that we do now. Text languages should never be used in formal settings. Um, there is no need to SOP and GGMUB, all those things. You don't do that in formal settings. It turns people off seriously. I know people that would never give a job to someone that abbreviates OK as OK. I think it's just important to be formal when it's time to be formal and be casual when we're being casual and don't take casual context into from our context. I'm very sure that everyone in this room has learned something tonight. Please celebrate yourself and let's celebrate them. Thank you very much, gentlemen.